thank you very much, Cairns. It's uh, very nice to be back in Aberdeen again, as, as, as always. And, uh, you know, if, if you think that in any way Aberdeen is a kind of remote um, northeastern coastal town, well, I can give you another remote northeastern coastal town, but uh, Umeå in this case, which, is, which sort of has the same geographical position within Sweden as, as Aberdeen has in, 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 in Scotland. But, of course, that means that it's significantly further north and east of, 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 of here. And, uh, well, it's an interesting environment, a beautiful environment, actually, but um, it, has its, it has its challenges as well. You've probably worked out by now that I'm not Swedish, if you're um, at all used to listening, listening to native English accents. Um, but I just happen to have, have worked there over, over an extended period of, of, of time, as well as uh, working in other places. Global health, we were just, we were just chatting before we started. <laughs> Global health is a, is a subject that really is ever increasingly place independent, I think, and, uh, the, you know, partly the, the technology and other developments along the way have helped us in that, in that it's, it's less and less important where you are or where, where different people are, there's more and more communication and so on, and I think that's a, that's a positive aspect of, uh, of, of global development, actually, and perhaps one that um, this centre in its new format will be able to explore a bit the, the, the contribution that the sort of new ways of international networking make processes possible that facilitate uh, development. I'm going to talk specifically, um, and you may, you may say, well, you know, this is an interesting starting point in a meeting about about global development to start from the perspective of data and, and information, partly because that's the kind of nerdy thing that I tend to do. So, you know, that's, that's, that's probably why that's the, um, that, that's the subject matter. But I do think there's a certain symbolism, actually, in, in, in starting from maybe not, in everybody's view, the most obvious starting point, but to say, well... <laughs> Actually, what is the key role of data and information in the context of global development? And to what extent does the, do the processes of global development actually depend on good information and, and good data? So I hope by the time I've finished, I might have convinced you, if you're a bit sceptical at the moment, that data and information are absolutely key to this whole issue of how the world can develop. And of course, when we say how the world can develop, what we're basically implying is how can we address major inequalities that persist throughout the world. That, that's, that's the whole essence, really, of the phrase, at least in my understanding, of, of global development. How can we address the often uh, very pervasive and very apparently... Um, intractable um, differences in all sorts of ways, living conditions, socioeconomics, and all the rest of it, that actually dictate the shape of the world. And some of the examples that I'm going to show you hopefully will, will address some of those issues. So as Ken says, um, <coughs> I'm direct the UMU Centre for Global Health Research. We've established where that is. And also, we host the WHO Collaborating Centre for Verbal Autopsy. So I will say a little bit about verbal autopsy, because it's almost impossible for me to give a talk without mentioning it. But uh, that's by, by no means the subject you'll be grateful to know. The unequal world of global health data. We could, of course, leave out health, really, in that phrase if we wanted to, because uh, much of what I'm going to say would apply equally to many other sectors of, of, of development. But obviously I come at it from a health perspective and so the kind of examples that I'm going to talk about will relate to health. This is an interesting map that gives you uh, the sort of overview of the situation in many ways in a perhaps surprising to, to, to many people. So this is the World Health Organization's map of 
the extent to which deaths are given causes around the world. Now, if you originate from this part of the world, uh, I, I don't mean literally from Aberdeen, I mean you know, this kind of northern European part of the world, or western European part of the world, you will of course have grown up in an environment where you probably have never questioned the fact that when somebody dies it's very important that A, the fact of that death is recorded in an official sense and B, the medical cause of that death is recorded. And those are two distinctly different things but complement each other. And of course it's impossible, it's illegal for a death to not be recorded and not to have a cause of death in the societies that many of us are, are familiar with. But the reality, actually, is that for most of the world, and I'm talking in rough figures about two-thirds of the deaths that occur in the world, even today, are not recorded and are not given causes of death. Some deaths are recorded and not given a cause, but uh, even bigger proportion um, you know, so it's, it's, there's a spectrum. You can be re recorded and with a cause, recorded without a cause, and uh, not recorded at all. And this is WHO's estimates, and you can see it's a pretty stark map because it, the white areas, less than 25% of deaths recorded, you can see is almost all of Africa, large parts of, of Asia, whereas the 90 to 100 percent of cause of death registration is the Americas, most of the Americas at least, most of Europe and Australasia. This is a little bit of a misleading map as well though because this is supposed to be civil registration coverage of cause of death. What it doesn't give any information about is the veracity of those causes. So South Africa, for example, is an interesting um, anomaly, as it were, or exception within the African continent where apparently there is good coverage of cause of death. But do you believe cause of death as reported in South Africa? No, absolutely not. If you, if you look at um, some of the uh, figures that are produced, it, the coverage is there, but the content in terms of um, factual levels and uh, reliability is, is, is not there. So this isn't an easy situation to keep on top of globally. The most obvious example of that in South Africa was that um, as, you, as you're probably well aware, that there's been a, it's one of the countries that's been most affected by the global um, HIV AIDS pandemic, now coming under control. But about 10 years ago, there was a massive peak of mortality associated with, with AIDS in South Africa, something like 20 to 30 percent of all deaths in 2005, that sort of period, were due to, to, to AIDS. And if you read the um, statistical reports of Statistics South Africa, for whom I have the greatest respect, and I, I know the statistician general very well, all his reports say about 2% of the deaths were due to AIDS in the, in, the, in the same period. And it's not because he wasn't doing his job properly. He was absolutely doing his job properly. But his job was to collect the returned death certificates and add them all up and say, well, how many of them <laughs> report uh, AIDS? And he was doing that totally reliably. The problem was that for various reasons, the people who were responsible for writing those death certificates, which were health professionals in the, within the health system, were very reluctant and often also under a lot of pressure not to put AIDS on the death certificates. They knew what was going on. But, you know, you can always think of something else to put on a death certificate. So if, if AIDS isn't particularly acceptable, you can put TB, because an awful lot of people who die of AIDS also are infected with TB. And 
actually, if you really want to put something meaningless on a death certificate, you can always do it. I mean, heart failure is a good one. I mean, you know, how many, how many dead people's hearts are still functioning? <laughs> you know, it's, it's difficult to contradict that. So there is a real problem. Old age is another interesting one. You know, yeah, it's, uh, it's very plausible in lots of cases. So just having death certificates is not the same thing as having a good <laughs> understanding of cause of death. And that, so there is a real information gap in that sense and one that needs to be um, addressed. So although WHO make these estimates, you still, uh, or um, not estimates actually, although they, they, they count the causes of death that are reported from every country because countries are supposed to report stuff to WHO, um, you do have to interpret what they say with a certain degree of, of, of scepticism. Interestingly, though, as well as what is actually done on an individual basis, like certifying deaths or not certifying deaths, as the case may be, there's been a growing industry internationally over the last five years or so of making global estimates of all kinds of things. And whether or not you're aware of it, you will have seen in numerous... Um, you know, television reports and newspaper reports, as well as the scientific literature. You know, the latest estimate is that there are so many thousands of maternal deaths in the world, or, you know, this country has the highest rate of um, <coughs> tuberculosis deaths, or, or what, whatever the case might be. And these estimates are made usually because of a lack of data. Now, that's both a good and a bad thing. In one sense, it's good that some very clever people in the world are spending a lot of time in saying, well, where we haven't got the data we wish we had, we're going to apply some very fancy statistics and models and all the rest of it, and we're going to come up with some numbers which are the best numbers that we can come up with in the absence of data. That's not a bad thing to do. It can be important. What's very important to realize, though, is that that is not the same process as actually having or getting the data that you wished you had in the, in the, in the first place. And there is a bit of a danger, and I'm going to come back to this later, but there is a bit of a danger that, of saying, well, OK, we've got these very plausible-sounding estimates now of almost anything in the world that you can very easily access on the, on the Internet, so why bother to actually you know, get out there and do the counting? And it's becoming so plausible that some of the language is even kind of crossing over. You know, it's not people are a bit sloppy with the way that some of these things are reported, and people do estimates and then say our results show that uh, such and such. You know, estimates are not results. They are findings, maybe. They are interesting. They are very often quite accurate. But to call estimates results can be extremely misleading, <laughs> at least in the, in the scientific sense. And that's a, that's a, a real challenge for some of this uh, global development work. This figure is an interesting example. It comes from BMC Medicine. It happens to relate to cirrhosis deaths, deaths from uh, chronic liver disease. And the estimates of cirrhosis deaths were made and published in an article. Um, and for every country, there was a, a big table, 190 countries or something, and for each country, how many deaths from cirrhosis had there been? So what's very interesting then is to look at how many cirrhosis deaths are estimated, because that, that's what that table would have been, how many cirrhosis deaths were estimated for each country, and then say, well, as input to that estimation process, how many cirrhosis deaths were actually recorded for each country as part of the input side of the estimates. And that's really what this 
slide shows. So the red countries are the countries for which there were indeed estimates of cirrhosis deaths made, but where there were precisely zero cases actually recorded as, as estimates. And this is where you have to realize the extent and the power to which these estimation models are actually applied and the extent to which they may or may not work. So most of Africa, there was no input to the model about the number of cirrhosis deaths. And yet every country in Africa nevertheless had an estimate of how many people had died of, 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 of cirrhosis. And those were not stupid numbers. I mean, they weren't plucked out of the air, but they were constructed from related things about socioeconomics and, uh, you know, all sorts of different uh, covariates, as the estimators like to call them, which means, you know, in knowing something that might vaguely be related to what you actually want to measure, but not actually having information on what you really want to measure. And... It is a problem, and this was a particularly interesting example because, curiously enough, the highest rates of cirrhosis mortality in this study were in Africa. Interesting, considering that there was virtually no data there to, 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 to start with. Now, it's not totally implausible because also we know that the highest rates of hepatitis B infection, which can lead to chronic cirrhosis, are found in Africa. And so, you know, it's not, it's not totally off the wall stuff, but it's not epidemiological evidence in the conventional sense of epidemiological evidence. And it's separating the, those kind of nuances that I think are, are, are quite important. And you can see, actually, the bright green countries, that these are the only countries in this particular um, study where at least half of real cirrhosis deaths were used as input data to the models. So, and you, you, can, you can guess fairly accurately where those might have been. Whether I believe the South African ones, bearing in mind what I was saying earlier, is, an, is, an, is another question, but at least they thought they had evidence from, from, from South Africa. So, so that's, the, that's, that's part of the dilemma around this question of data and um, ev evidence in relation to, to global development. So conceptually, this is what we're dealing with. There are, there's a huge range of, if we're, if we're going to continue to talk about vital events, deaths, births, movements, um, you know, individual um, life events, there's a huge range of the proportion of those events that are registered in different parts of the world. Africa at the low end and Europe and Australasia at the highest end. Equally, going up this axis, there are huge differences in the effects of applying these sophisticated modeling estimating efforts. And so this is the, this is the tension that we're, that, we're, that we're dealing with. So in the, in the places where the smallest proportions of real-life events are actually known as matters of fact, then, of course, the effects of applying the models are huge because you're, you've got a model that's very clever, very sophisticated, but which is starved of input. And so, you know, you, there's a real danger of kind of magnifying the very scarce data that you put in into something that may or may not be actually reflecting reality. So the, the modeling effects are biggest where you've got the least data, and the modeling effects are smallest where you've got the most data. I happen to chair the um, UN technical group on maternal mortality estimates. So lots of people play these games, and the UN for many years have been um, trying to track maternal deaths around the world. It's a very important parameter in terms of, of health services and many other things. And we had a very interesting um, <coughs> correspondence between the UN panel and a certain Scandinavian country that I won't mention by name um, a few years ago, 
And this Scandinavian country insisted that in a particular year there had been four maternal deaths. Scandinavia has some of the lowest rates of maternal death in the world, you understand. And so not only were they sure that their rates were low, but they knew specifically who these four women were that had died. They also have very good registration procedures. And so we were working up at this end of this picture, but it's still possible that the models have a bit of an influence because there's little adjustments for possible incompleteness of recording and, and such like. So these four maternal deaths from this country went into the modeling process and they came out as five. <laughs> and can you imagine the emails that were flying backwards and forwards from Geneva to Scandinavia about this? You know, actually, it's a totally inconsequential question because, you know, if your maternal mortality is four per 100,000 deliveries or five per 100,000 deliveries, you haven't got a problem, frankly. <laughs> uh, you know, at, at any... Because, you know, in Africa, we're talking about four or five hundred, not four or five. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's worthwhile arguing about four or five hundred and the difference between those. But the difference between four and five is pretty unmeasurable. But that debate went on for, for some time. That's the nature of international diplomacy. <laughs> but it just illustrates where we are at different points along this spectrum. Now, I'm going to say a little bit about my pet subject of verbal autopsy. If you're wondering what verbal autopsy is, that's a very reasonable question because it's not something that hits the headlines on a, on a very regular basis. But the principle of verbal autopsy is that if a death has not been um, certified through the health system, in other words, didn't, <laughs> probably didn't occur in a facility and there was no you know, direct medical process going on leading up to the, to, to, to the death, the question is, how do you decide after the fact what, what might have been the cause of death? And WHO has done a lot of work on, um, on producing standards for actually interviewing either family members or caregivers of people who have recently uh, died in a standardized way, collecting data which is not questionnaire data for its own sake, but is meant to provide a source of data from which it is possible to derive a cause of death. Because obviously, you know, by and large, particularly in, in poorer communities, if somebody dies, you can't necessarily expect that family members and, and, and so on will have any direct insights as to what the medical cause of death might have been. In some cases, it's easy. They say, well, they were run over by a bus. You know, in the, the, that, that's the, uh, anybody can kind of report that in a, in a reasonably reliable way. But if it's something more subtle, some infection or some non-communicable disease, you need to get at it indirectly. And so WHO have produced um, standard interview protocols that involve going through, and you can see in the picture here, this is, this is one that was done in Tanzania, um, where the interviewer here is going through on his tablet a whole series of questions. So it would be questions like, you know, did the person who died have a fever before they died? If you say no, you go on to the next set of questions about, you know, did they have problems breathing and so on. But if, if the answer to the fever is yes, well, you know, how long did the fever last for, well, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a very kind of hierarchical um, questionnaire structure with a lot of complicated skip patterns. But the good thing is, particularly if you've got a tablet, which is an ideal way of navigating the interviewer through this rather complicated set of total questions, you can do quite a good interview in around 15 minutes or so. And the work that we've led, particularly at our centre, is actually then processing that information into cause of death on an, on an individual basis. 
as I said a few minutes ago, this is different from most questionnaire surveys because when you've done a whole lot of these verbal autopsies, it's not terribly interesting to know that 28% of deaths had fever. That's not, that, that doesn't actually <laughs> tell you anything. You want to actually take all of the answers from one case and say, okay, the combination of this and this and this and this and this and that and not, not that and not, not the other and their age and their sex and you know, everything else that you know about this death you say, okay, this was probably a death due to malaria, or this was probably a death due to stroke, or whatever the, the, the case might be. And WHO have defined um, 63 categories of different kinds of death that, that they want to um, assign individual deaths to. And so we have a computer model that does that. That's the easy bit of the process. So once you've been out and done this interview and collected the data, the model almost instantaneously will say, well, the cause of death in this case was probably such and such. And that's what we mean by, by verbal autopsy. So when I refer a bit later to verbal autopsy now, hopefully you know what I'm talking about. But the big question is what is needed to make this happen on a large scale? Because just as, coming back to this Western European setting, when somebody dies, you are re a, a competent person, a, a physician is required to write a death certificate and then the family or other, you know, whoever's, whoever's around the death is required to take that certificate to the registrar and register the, the death. So there's a, there's a kind of process that you are obliged to <coughs> engage with when somebody has died. And that's what's missing in this, in this context. How do, how do you move from a, point, from, a, from a position where it's perfectly acceptable for somebody to die and we don't really follow it up, we don't, we don't do anything about it? How do you move from that to actually, A, doing the verbal autopsy, B, collecting the results and, 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 and collating them so that you fill in those big white spaces on the WHO map that I started with? It's important, of course, to know that we have methods that, that work. And that, that's actually quite, I mean, it's, it, that's stating the obvious in scientific terms, but it's easier said than done to actually show that that, that is the case. And all you can really do is compare different things and say, well, different processes lead to similar conclusions. And that's all that this rather spotty chart is, is, is trying to say. So for a whole range of countries and for a whole range of diseases, we've taken mortality rates for specific causes, specific age groups, specific places, specific time periods, and we've taken them from two different sources. The estimates from the Global Burden of Disease study, so that's with all the um, caveats that I've mentioned earlier about the processes of generating estimates on this axis, and a, di a different set of data, which is from the in-depth network, and th those are at these up, up here are the mortality rates that are derived from actual verbal autopsies in those particular places, but by no means complete coverage. So you're comparing two unlike things, is essentially, the, the only thing that's similar is that they're both arriving at mortality rates. The process by which they get there is totally different. And all that we did here was to compare the two and say, well, actually, they compare remarkably well. So this line, this is not a conventional um, line of fit, it's actually the line of equivalence. So 1 and 1 are equivalent, 10 and 10 are equivalent, and so on on the line. So in a theoretical environment, all of those points would be exactly on the line. Obviously, they're not, and there are good reasons for that being the case. But statistically, they are actually very uh, closely related. And that doesn't tell us that either one or the other is correct, but it does say that they're they're much more similar than you would expect them to be if they were just, you know, doing different, doing totally different things or measuring totally different things. So we might not believe either the global burden of disease source, we might not believe the in-depth uh, 
source, we might have different reasons for being skeptical of either of them, but they are actually agreeing remarkably well. So the, the fact that that is the case suggests that both of them actually are not bad ways of, 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 of addressing this issue. So what about the technical barriers? People tend to say, well, you know, it's all very well, but if you had these huge quantities of data, how on earth would you handle it? Whatever would you, would you do with it? How would you uh, make it work? Well, I did a little bit of back of the envelope calculation. Actually, this, is, uh, this example is, is coming in a Lancet comment at the end of this week, if you want to see it in a bit more detail. But there are about 670 million under five children in the world. Okay, that's just fact. I say about because nobody's counting them or registering all the births even, although birth registration is a bit better than death registration. And about, there are about six million deaths among those 670 million under five children every, every year. That's the kind of headline situation, so about 1%. Now, if hypothetically you knew for every child under five in the world, who they were, where they live, when they were born, you know, just the basic details of every one of those 670 million children. You could store that fairly effectively in a 250 character string. You could store more than that actually in a 250 character string, but you know, that, that's, that's, that's doable. And believe it or not, you can store 670 million times 250 characters on about half of the storage of a laptop. Not a problem. Okay, lap the, the whole sort of information revolution has mushroomed so rapidly in recent years that li literally my laptop that I've got on my seat there, could half of its capacity could store the basic details of every under five child in the world. And you'd still have, that's only half of it, so you'd still have a, plenty of space to have a lot more detail about those 1% of those children who'd, who died. So you could have cause of death and all the verbal autopsy and so on. Now, I'm not actually saying that it's a practical or sensible option to keep records on every under five child in the world on my laptop. But, you know, it illustrates the... The, the, the technical stuff that would be involved. And if you could do that, of course, once you had all those details of those 670 million children in one place, in one database, you wouldn't need to do any fancy modeling or any estimating because you, 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 would, you would have it all. You could just make some tables, you know, in a very traditional epidemiological sort of sense. It's not, not difficult to do at all. So we need to dismiss from discussion the answer that you, you can't handle the data. I mean, that, that, is, that is not the issue. We're, we're no longer talking about um, IT constraints on the volume of data that's involved to actually keep track of the world's population. And that has changed hugely. You might not believe it, and it makes me sound very old, but... Um, I can remember when I, when I, I, I worked in the Gambia for a long time in the, in the 1980s, and I can remember when I first went there, I had a database relating to 15,000 people, which seemed a huge database in the 1980s. And if I wanted to index it, to just to sort it on ID number or name, I used to set it going when I went home at night, and if I was lucky it had finished sorting 15,000 records by the next morning. I mean, that, that is the magnitude of, the, of development in terms of, 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 of IT. So nobody should be making the argument that we can't handle the data about the world's population. We absolutely can these days. And of course, to, nowadays, to index 15,000 records, that it's done before you can even think which which button to click next on your screen. So the problem is not handling the data. The problem is actually identifying the people and collecting the data, documenting the, 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 the lives that need to be documented. And so 
the need for actually registering people's identity and their lives and the events that happen is really critical. And this is most critical in relation to the identification of deaths, but you also obviously need to know births, you need to know locations, you need to know where, you know, the, a number of basic things about your population. Standard verbal autopsy is an important component of that because cause of death actually, although it might sound, you know, it might seem quite strange to be obsessed as I am with cause of death, but it actually tells you a huge amount about what health services you need, what way, where you need them, how you need to invest in, in, in resources for living people. So the, the data about who dies of what, where, when, how, are incredibly valuable, actually, in terms of understanding what should we be doing for the people who have not yet died. And you need to do that in robust ways, and it needs to be distributed and analysed transparently. And, and as I've already made clear, I hope, the more complete your data are, the easier it is to be transparent about how you analyse them and how you, how you come to your conclusions. The most difficult data to analyse rigorously are, are incomplete data. If, if some of you have ever tried doing surveys and had poor response rates and so on, you, you, you'll realise exactly why that is the, the, the case. If you only you know, get a 30% response rate when you send out a questionnaire, it's very, very difficult to actually put in enough caveats and adjustments and so on to, to decide what the results really mean because you really want to be knowing what would have been the responses from the 60 or 70% who didn't respond. And it's just the same with this stuff. We really need to know, we really need to have those complete data because the more complete your data are, the easier it is to understand what's, what's, what's actually going on. So finally, to generalise my obsessions about mortality to global development a bit more in general, I think it's reasonable to say that good information systems and high quality data with good on the ground implementations, not just in Scandinavia, but in Africa and everywhere else where people live, are critical to development in general. They're certainly critical to health development, but I think it's also true for agricultural development, it's true for social development, it's true for you know, questions like housing and pensions and so many um, long-term population-based uh, issues. As an epidemiologist, I'm always fond of talking about the unit of observation. And when, when epidemiologists talk about unit of observation, we mean the level at which you are observing things. Are you trying to say, well, the, um, you know, the proportion of um, under 15-year-olds in this country is so many percent? In other words, are you making an observation at country level? Or are you saying, actually, we know about every individual. We make the observation at individual level, and then, of course, it's very easy to say, well, how many of those individuals are, are, are under 15? That, that's, a, that's kind of almost goes without saying if you've actually bothered to, to, to count everybody. So I would say that progress in global development, both making progress and being able to evaluate and document that progress, and both sides of that coin are critical to, to global development. You need to change things in people's lives, but you also need to be able to demonstrate that the actions that are being taken are actually bringing about change. And both of those things are critically dependent, I think, on good individual level routine observations, not just these high-level observations and estimates, although they have their place and they do have some value. There was a Lancet editorial piece last year which had a great title. Content is something else. No, the content's all right as well. But the, it had a really great title, which was Everyone Counts, So Count Everyone. And I think that is really 
a fundamental principle to, to, to global development that we need to take very seriously. So whatever our speciality might be in, in terms of global development, whether it's um, you know, energy law in John's case, or whether it's leprosy in Ken's case, or whatever it might be, what, whichever particular area we're interested in in global development, we really need to take this very seriously, that everyone counts and we must count everyone to both achieve development and demonstrate that we have achieved development. Thank you very much.